Um, go ahead and cut the monitors on the, on the headset, if you would, please. If ever I have had a word to deliver from the Lord, I feel like I have that word today. Not that I'm anything special, because God talks to a lot of people. Not saying everybody listens, but he talks to a lot of people. When you're wearing a vest, your greatest enemies are things really high and things on the ground. <laughs> you, would know, you would know if you're, if you're on a vest and it's doing everything you can to keep things where they are. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to start with our text there. When you get there, look at your neighbor and say, you're pretty today. Lord, forgive us for lying. Those of us who deceive, Father, we pray that you would just watch over them. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen and precious in God's sight, you also, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. How many people were in church in the 80s remember that song, I Lay in Zion? Anybody? You can see. Me and Dee, we're going to do a Jewish praise and worship service one day, because we're, we, just, we know all the you know, Jehovah Jireh, and they rush on the city and run on the walls, and all the good ones. that We used to just have a time, didn't we? I'm going to try my clicker. We didn't do a clicker test today, so I'm putting a lot of extra pressure on our IT, on our IT crew back there. But I believe in them that they can do this especially since I put like 30,000 transitions and I won't know where I'm going without this. So no pressure, guys. You got this. Last week, we started talking about altar tabernacles and temples. We started talking about being an altar place in your life, a tabernacle place in your life, or a temple place in your life. And the, right, the way I want to kind of frame this is that everybody goes through these phrases. In our church, I would say probably 20% of the people in the church are coming in today and they're in an altar place in their life, and 20% are in a temple place in their life, but 60%, most of us here, are in a tabernacle place in our life, and I'm going to explain what that means, but first let's kind of review the altar place, because some of you guys are like, altar place? What are you even talking about, Pastor? Slow down, you're talking too fast, right? The altar place is this. It begins when you're called out, right? Right? Abraham was called out. God speaks to him. He says, hey, you're going to go into a land. You're going to go into a land I show. You're going to walk everywhere you walk. Imagine that everywhere he walks is going to be his one day. How many of you would just go circle your neighbor's house or car? Come on. Come on. Right? So they're called out. Jacob was called out, right? He's called out from among his brothers. He's got the birthright. God said the blessing is going to be reckoned through you, right? Um, and then when you're ready to change your identity, with Jacob, he becomes Israel, right? With Abram, he becomes Abraham. There's something about coming to an altar place in your life that when you come to that altar place, you don't leave the same person that came. If you did, then that probably wasn't an altar place. That was probably just you getting indigestion or something and thinking the, the Spirit had moved on you. I don't mean to question anybody's experience, but if you come to Christ and don't change, I don't know that we've met the same guy. Amen? All right. You're all with me. Nobody's mad yet. Wait a while. Second, it's characterized by an awakening. I like the word awakening. You know, anybody who's ever dealt with people who've gone through addictions, if you've ever gone through addiction and you're in a meeting and they're talking about it, there's always that point, right? That point in the life where they just couldn't go on the way it was going on. Something happened. It was a look in their kids' eyes. It was something they realized that was happening around. They got to this place and they're like, I can't live like this. I can't stay in this place. I can't continue doing what I'm doing. Well, the altar place is a place of awakening. It's that place where Jacob, who's scared of Esau, goes to sleep, and all of a sudden God's showing up to him in dreams, right? And the next time he gets there, God wrestles with him. And Jacob's the only person trying to wrestle back with God. Who else would just be like, no, you win. No, it's, it's good, you know. But not Jacob. He's going to wrestle this thing out. It's a place of awakening, a place where your life, suddenly you have that realization, that, I, that identity change. Because... Well, what I said earlier, I didn't want to repeat myself. That's okay. It's a place of sanctifying. The first taste of your anointing is the anointing he gives you the first day you really consecrate your life. Pastors shouldn't be the only people that feel anointed. Did you know that? 
Do you know when I used to feel anointed back, but when I was, I would call it when I was in that, in that stage before I knew God wanted to do something with me, but I didn't know what it was. I would just randomly run into conversations and somehow the Lord would come up and the next thing you know, something changed about what I was saying. I was saying words that I didn't know, right? Not speaking in tongues, but literally saying things. Wisdom was coming out of me that wasn't my wisdom. Knowledge was coming out of me that wasn't my knowledge. And I was saying things that I didn't expect because God was beginning to use me in a new anointing. He was putting something in my life. When the Bible says, when they take you before judges and you get in that stressful situation, don't worry about what you're going to say because in that moment, the Holy Spirit's going to give you the words you need to say. And every Christian should have the joy of experiencing that. Now, if you haven't, and we're going to go over this, it might be that you need to build an altar. It might be that you need to come to a place of consecration, awakening in your life. And the last one is hearing. And this is what we talked about last week, that hearing the voice of God is not optional in a Christian's life. That Jesus said, my sheep will know my voice. Right? My my dog knows when I call Kristen around 11 o'clock. Do you know why? Because Kristen, she lives next door, and sometimes since I'm here at the church, I'll call her up and you want to get some lunch, and so we'll get in the car and we'll go grab, you know, something, then we'll go park at the park and just kind of sit there in the river or whatever, and you know who wants to come along, right? The dog. And so it doesn't matter what else happens. If he hears my voice on the phone around 11 o'clock, he's grabbing his, he, has, he, he grabs a sock or a shoe or something to take with him. I don't know why. But he grabs it and he goes to the door like, hey, wagging his tail. Okay, it's go time. He knows my voice. Anyone else can call my house at 11 o'clock and he's not going to do that. But he is because he has an expectation that when I call, something good is about to happen. Did you know you're going to hear the voice of God when every time the presence of God shows up, you come at it with an expectation that God is about to do something good, that you're expecting something good out of him? Did you know that people you expect to disappoint you will disappoint you? Did you know that? Did you know that people you expect to not disappoint you may still disappoint you, but not as much? And it won't hurt as much because you're looking at him in love and love bears all things and believes all things and hopes all things and endures all things, right? So hearing the voice of God is not optional and it's not for preachers. And when you've been to the altar moment, it results in this. You're dropping your baggage. We talked about how the early altars, and I'm going to show you a little difference here because <laughs> you know, anybody that's been here a long time knows I'm a little nerdy, okay? And I love to, I love to study some archaeology and I love, to, I love to dig in that. And you know, the early altars were different than the later altars. In fact, this is more of a picture of an early altar where they wouldn't be cut stones. They would just pile stones in a specific way. And what we talked about last week was that you take all these things in your life, all these events, and you begin to pile them up around the cross and you make an altar out of them and you put it on the altar and you just sacrifice that thing to the Lord. See that, that, an all, an, a, a sacrifice has no rights. So, let's say, let's say I have a problem with my sister who watches this on Facebook. So, I don't really, Annette, you think, I think. Um, but if I have a problem with her, if she's wronged me, if she's done something to me, if I know she's mad at me, right? But I know that I can't get on with my life until I forgive that thing. I, I had a conversation with somebody that, that came to church this week just to give me the business about something they were mad about. And, and I just accepted it. Okay, man, you know, let me, let me have, it. have it. Have it out, right? That's, that's what I'm here for, to be abused, right? Just beat me a little stick, we'll be good. But what I told them is you can't move on until you forgive that person. Sometimes you get so much unforgiveness, sometimes you get so much hurt in your background, you can't get past it, right? And there's nothing to do with it. Right? Because, you know, if, if someone's really done you wrong and you're really mad about it, even if you could stand right in front of them and express exactly what it was that they did that hurt you and it really bothered you and you're really letting them know that it did, they're just going to look at you and have no idea what you're talking about because it was probably way more important to you than it was to them. So you can't do anything. They can't forgive you in such a way that you feel that kind of burden released. So what you do is you lay that thing at the feet of God. And you say, God, I can't fix this relationship. I've messed it up beyond repair. I've been mean to this person because they hurt me first, and I, I, they deserved what I did, but I shouldn't have done it, and I can't fix it now, and there's nothing I can do. And all you can do is take everything that's happened and make an altar out of it and put it at the feet of Jesus and say, this is your decision to make. 
Every time I think about that person, every time they come across my mind, every time something reminds me of them, I'm just going to turn back to you and say, Lord, I set that on an altar. Because an altar is a place of memorial remembrance that you can always go back to and say, this is where God did it. This is where it happened. Right? You take it out of your hands, you give it to him, you change your appetite. Did you know after you've been past the altar that you should taste food different? You know what I mean? Sin should taste different. Things that you used to do don't feel the same way they used to did, right? That it should change your appetite, and you should be ready to pack up and leave. Because the altar is a place that you stop at. It's not a place that you live at, right? You stop there. God changes your direction. He gives you word. He gives you vision, and then you move on. And that's what we're talking about, being in the altar place, that you're just in that place in your life. And a lot of this, a lot of this, is, a lot of this is pre-salvation, right, that before you really come to know the Lord, you're kind of wandering around, and basically what happens is you have really good times when you, you have a friend who's a Christian, and you're around them, and you guys are having a great time of fellowship, and then you leave and go to the bar, right, and you get sloshing drunk and mess up everything and do something stupid, but then you come back, and all of a sudden you're in church, and you're praising God, and you're having that altar experience again, but then as soon as you leave, you go back to that crowd that you were with before, and you're doing the same sort of things and telling the same jokes and doing all that, and you have this big up and down. It's like a wave, like a sine wave, right? You're your highs and your lows. You get to the altar, and as soon as you get away from the altar, man, you're right back in that thing, right? At some point, you've got to move out of the altar phase. At some point, you've got to move into the tabernacle phase. I love clickers when they work. There we go. We gotta move. Oh, that, that was kind of a useless slide. It was really just to say those two things, which I easily transitioned without saying those. So what is the tabernacle? Let's talk about the tabernacle itself first. You guys can read all that from back there, right? That's, that's the, I, knew, I knew it wouldn't be, and really I just want you to get the picture, and, and I'll just tell you what the words are up there. But I want to show you the tabernacle's layout for a particular reason, because when God built the tabernacle, he built it in very symbolic ways. Everything that he puts in the tabernacle has a particular symbolism with it. If you were here a few months ago, we were talking about how the showbread that sets in the holy place was a type of communion, and it was God setting the table for us, waiting for us to be able to come. And for a thousand years, he sets that table until finally Christ comes as the one true bread, and we get to sup with God face to face. And this is in the tabernacle. And here's another interesting thing about that in particular is that other ancient religions at that time did something similar with setting out bread for the gods, but they always said they were setting out bread to feed their gods. They were setting out things so their god could consume them but because their god needed subsistence. Ours came and said, no, I will feed you. And the priest would actually sit in the temple, in the, in the, in the room of presence, and they would eat the showbread there. But the tabernacle is like this. You've got your outer court here, You've got your entrance to the holy, of ho the holy place here, and this is the Holy of Holies. Now, in case you're wondering for scale about how big it is, this little piece here, which is the holy place, would be about the size, and I, it, it's kind of funny, the measurements almost add up exactly from the back wall to this wall, this side of the building would be the size of the holy place in the tabernacle. It's about, we're about 70 feet long in here, and, except that it would only be, um, I think, 10 feet wide. Is it? I'm looking at, if anybody knows it by heart, it would be Lynn. That's why I looked at him. On the, yeah. It's about 10 feet wide. So if you're wondering about how big the holy place would be, it would be about that. So then you picture there's a holy of holies behind it. But it's made in three pieces, right? You have an outer court. In your outer court, you have two things. You have this brazen altar of burnt offerings, and you have a brazen laver. The laver is for washing your hands, and the burnt offerings are for well, burnt offerings. In fact, this side of the tent has a big door because obviously when you're burning things, setting them on fire inside a tent, you want a little bit of outlet there, right? Now, the brazen altar was not uncut stone. By this point in Israel's history, because now the tabernacle has become portable, they actually fashioned this altar and it has horns. In fact, there were two pictures of an altar. The other altar looked kind of like a square, and on each side of the square it had kind of a little raised piece. Those are actually called the horns of the altar. They've actually found these um, in Israel where they find different altars, and they have those horns. So anywhere you're seeing horns of the altar in the Bible, or even the word horns, they're usually referring to that part of the square that you could hold on to because the, sanctuary, the altar was also a sanctuary. Because if you had done something, anything short of murder, you could run to the altar and hold on to it and ask for clemency so that you know, somebody couldn't come take their eye for an eye. Now, what I like about it, though, is that we put this burnt offering, we put the altar here, and we've got the labor here. So if you're thinking about this as you, and this is why this looks like you, by the way. You know why that is? 
Because God said, let us create man in our image, right? We believe in a trinity, a Father, and a Son, and the Holy Ghost. And when he creates us in his image, he creates us as body, soul, and spirit. That we have a body made of flesh, we have a soul which dwells within us, and we have a spirit that connects to God. We are three parts just like God is three parts. And that's the easiest way for me to explain the trinity. Just like you have a body, and you have a soul, and you have a spirit, so God is body, soul, and spirit, and all parts are in unity, right? My soul's never telling my hand to do. Now, this is funny. When you get older, it does, right? Your soul does say, hey, body, do something. Your body's like, no, right? Any of us who've aged a couple of years, I say it takes a lot of groans for me to get from the couch to the stairs, you know, you know, everything you're getting off of and, and you're making a lot of groans, but you have a soul, you have a body, and you have a spirit. Well, here in our picture, we have the outer court of the body. We have the inner place of the soul, and then we have the holy of holies, which is where the presence and the Spirit of God dwelled at the mercy seat. And I want you to understand that because all of this, I, I am going to really, really use a lot of symbolism, but it holds. Um, so the brazen altar is there. Oh, man. I know. I, I promise you I had like eight pages and cut it back down to four, and I'm trying to figure out how much I can get to you guys before, you know, time runs out and everybody gets so hungry, you revolt and go torches and pitchforks on me, and I don't want that. Um, I'm hungry too. Trust me, I'm as hungry as you are because I'm fatter than you, and that makes me more hungry the longer it goes. But listen, that altar out front is there, and it's no longer the uncut stones that they started with, but now it's actually a portable altar that they can take from place to place. Because keep in mind, when they build the tabernacle, they go to Mount Sinai, right? And after Mount Sinai, it stops being altars everywhere, and God gives them the instructions for this is how you build the tabernacle. And everybody takes up a big collection, and they make a tabernacle. Now, they make the altars actually with wood overlaid with, um, in that case, I think it was brass, and they make them hollow so they're portable. And they fill them back up with earth, they think, some, whenever they place them down. But they make them portable. You know, you've got to take that ability to meet with God at the altar everywhere you go. You know, that was one of the things with me in my early Christianity that I thought I had to get to church to pray. I thought I had to get to church to really be in the presence of God. I thought that God dwelt in his house, in his temple, and not in my house. Right? And I heard somebody say this the other day, that we talk about the face of God, but you know you can't see the back of his head. That God's face is always towards you. That there's no place where you're out of his sight. And that means even at your lowest, even, even when you're mad at your husband and you're spitting in his food, God's still there with you, right? But even when you're praising the Lord and you're in church and God's there too, you know he's always with you at your top and at your bottom. Everywhere you're at, God is there and there's no escape from the presence of God. But we don't always recognize it and we don't always feel it. And sometimes we actively ignore it. In the outer court, you also have the brazen labor, a place of cleaning, and notice that cleansing, it's right outside of the holy place before they would go in, they, could, they would wash up before they went in. We are in need of constant cleansing, amen? I mean, we could, we could start off with all our sins forgiven at, at 7 a.m., and by 10 a.m., we, we probably need another dose, right? I mean, the world's a messy place, you know? You get your hands dirty a lot. But the key to finding God is to come to that place in your heart, you know... I don't mean this mean, but we're so dishonest. We're so convinced that we've got it, we've got it good enough that we don't need to be cleansed. We're like Peter. I don't need, don't wash my feet, Jesus. You don't wash my feet. You're Jesus. And he says, if you don't wash my feet, I don't have any place with you. And so he says, well, if you're going to wash my feet, wash my body and hands. And he goes, you don't need everything, Peter. Calm down. You know, you need places in your day that you can just stop and say, Lord, just cleanse me. And you need places in your day where you can just kind of wash your soul and just understand that the spirit and presence of God is wanting to dwell with you right in that place, right where you're at. He's not waiting for you to get home. He's not waiting for you to get back to church. He's right there and he wants communion with you. And we think of God in big terms, almighty God of the universe, El Shaddai, right? The God over everything. And yet, and I, I, almost got the, I almost got the picture because I, I, I like this. They, they took a picture of what a cell looks like, and they took a picture of what the universe looks like, and when you get really small, it looks exactly the same as when you get really big. Did you know that? That if you were to take the universe back from a certain, it looks actually like when you look inside a cell, it's all the same sort of clumps of light and stars, and, and all the things kind of match. The pattern holds all the way to the smallest part, all the way to the biggest part, because God only is God infinitely big, Lord of all the universe, but God is small enough to care what you're doing today. 
and to want to be with you and to fellowship with you because you, he made you in his image and in his likeness, and he wants to dwell with you. And the altar and the tabernacle are all about finding a way to dwell in the presence of God. Now, once we get into the holy place, I think I need to go another, yeah. In the holy place, you have this. You have a candlestick, you have an altar of incense, and you have the bread of the presence. And we've talked about this before, that in the holy place, if you were to, if you were to paint this like Picasso painted it, right, or who was Monet the Impressionist, right? She knows art better than I do. Monet did a thing called Impressionist, which I call bad painting, um, which basically instead of painting all the detail that the Renaissance painters would paint everything in intricate detail, all of a sudden they would just like paint in dots like uh, pointillism or they'd paint like an impression or generally kind of what you see. But there's a way that if you kind of squint when you look at the holy place, you can almost see the living room of God. Why do I say that? Because he's got a lamp. He's got a chair in the, in the mercy seat. He's got a light. He's got his lamp. And he's got a bread. He's got the table set for you. You can almost see where God wants to sit across from man and break bread. That he wants to fellowship with us at a deep and intimate level. And when you get into the holy place of your own life, you have to have the candlestick. You have to have that, that light, that hope, that knowing that God will. Can I just ask you that if, you, if you're expecting something to happen at the end of this service, if you're expecting to get to a place where God is going to be able to speak to you, you're more likely to get there than the one that doesn't than the one that sits back and says, well, I dare you to preach to me, preacher. I dare you to move on me, God. I've been there. No, I've crossed my arms. I'm not going to get... Man, I, 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 was, I, I was purposefully unsaved, right? Like, I was not saved and didn't want to be saved and almost like challenge accepted if you're going to try and save me. I don't want anything to do with this. And, and <laughs> it, it took a little bit for God to get my, my mind right, to get me in the right place. But man, it's so much better when you're expecting to know him and expecting to see him, what he does in that moment. At the altar of incense, there's a second altar. It's a smaller altar. I like this because on the outer altar is that place where you're sacrificing, where you're laying things down. God, my day stinks, right? And you're just laying that on the altar. I don't know what to do with this job, Lord, my boss. I'm going to cut his brake lines, God, if you don't do something, right? Lord, Jesus, help me, right? And you have that altar where you've got to lay that down and set that aside and say, God, they hurt me, and I don't know what to do about it, so I'm putting it on your altar right here. And you have that out there, and that's what that's for. And it's a bloody altar because that's where the sacrifice is made. But this altar is different because this is the altar inside the house, and this is the altar of incense, and it's only about yay big, and all it does is it burns incense. And that's that place in your heart where you just turn to God, and it doesn't matter what's going on, and it doesn't matter how bad things are. It doesn't matter that your team's going to lose the Super Bowl, and I hope that's the Patriots, right? It doesn't matter what's going on. You just say, thank you, God. Thank you that you are. Thank you that you're here. No matter what happens, no matter how good or bad or anything else goes, I don't know a lot of things, God, but I know that I love you and that you love me. And there's that incense going up before him. There's that thankfulness going up before him. There's that part of you that just praises him. That moment in the praise and worship where all of a sudden you don't notice anybody on the stage or what instruments are being played. You just have that, that one moment where all of a sudden you can almost hear the voice of God speaking something as you're praising him. That's that altar of incense, that little place where you keep yourself thankful and you keep yourself grateful and you keep yourself praising the Lord. And then you got the Holy of Holies. And what do you have in the Holy of Holies? You got your most, you've got your Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of Testimony. In fact, it, it goes either way on that word. One of the things about that word when we say Ark of Testimony because it's a testimony of the covenant, right? Um, I'm going to have to skip so much. I'm sorry. Um, but I got I to gotta get there. I got to get to what I know God wants to say, and I know he wants to speak to someone here today. Instead of an altar that stayed in one place where they would have to return, they had a place to meet with God that moved with them, right? And both the Ark of the Covenant and the altar at incense were made with wood and then overcovered, and they were covered. In the case of the Ark of the Covenant, it was made of wood, but it was overlaid with gold. And, and there's almost a symbol of, of, of how... <laughs> You have God and man meeting, right? Because again, everything about the altar, everything about the tabernacle, everything about the temple is where you meet God. And I know that sometimes we've made it in our society that the preacher meets God and lets us know how it went, right? Just, you know, let me know what he says, Lord. Or let me know, let me know what he says, Pastor. I'll be here and you just, you just give me a word. But that is, not, and that is not God's plan, is it? 
God's plan is to be able to meet with each of his kids, you know? What if I just loved my oldest one and said, hey, let me, let, let me know what the other two are doing. You know, if one of them gets in trouble or something, you just come to me and I'll work through you and I don't need to talk to Gareth or Triss. We'll just talk to Hunter because, you know, right? You would probably not like me as a dad, would you? Um, and God is that way that he wants relationship with each one of his kids. He doesn't want you. There is one God and there is one mediator between God and man and that person is Jesus Christ. And I stand up here because I have an anointing on my life to be in this church and to preach and, and to do those sorts of things, but I cannot replace the walk with God and the presence of God that you're supposed to dwell in. I can't do it for you. I can't want it bad enough that it just happens to you. It's got to be something that you want to happen, and it's got to be a place that you dwell, and it's got to be a sacrifice you make. You've got to have those two altars. You've got to have an altar where you put down all the bad stuff that you want to do, and then you've got to have an altar where you tell God all the good stuff that he is and that he's done. And if you can do those two things, you'll get your tabernacle going. Now, here's the thing about being in a tabernacle place. A tabernacle place is not a place of ultimate destiny, is it? God did not tell Moses, take your people out into the desert and we're just going to live there. Right? Take them out into the wilderness. That's their home. No, the reason it's a tabernacle is because God's got a promise on their life. He's got a place there he's going to take them to, and you need to be portable to get there. And that's why I say most people are still in the tabernacle place. They're not in the temple place. In fact, I would wager most Christians never make it to their temple place, that they stay in the tabernacle place. We'll get back to that. Because some of you are just coming off the altar place, and we just got to work on getting the tabernacle. See, here's the thing about getting to the temple. You can't get to the temple and inspect the Ark of the Covenant to already be there. You've got to have it in the tabernacle first, right? You don't get to the temple and expect the showbread and all the different things that you commune with God to just magically appear. You actually find those things in your tabernacle times in the wilderness. See, that's why you're wandering. That's why you're moving around. That's why you're constantly feeling restless and frustrated with the place you are in your life. And like, this isn't what I'm supposed to be because it's not what you're supposed to be because God has given you a mobile altar. He's given you a mobile throne, the, the Ark of the Covenant, because he wants to take you to someplace else. Man, we get attached to where we're at, right? We get our, we get our, we get our, our tent and everything just the right way. Your time of tabernacle begins... It says to click this. I, I wrote it in blue so I'd know to do that. Your tabernacle begins when you encounter the presence and the glory. Man, a lot of people, and I think this is why we come unchanged from the altar sometimes. Okay, because we're lazy. <laughs> Did you know that? Man, you know it takes like three minutes to cook pizza rolls. Did you know that? It is forever. I want a pizza roll now. I don't want one in three minutes, right? Or what about when you cook your burrito and you're happy that it's there and you get it out and it's still cold in the middle? Ah, oh, now I've got to wait another minute. I've got to put it back in. I've got to wait for things to happen, right? We have no concept of a God who wants to spend time with us and it's not microwave time, right? We have no concept. I mean, remember when I grew up, if you wanted something heated up, mom had to preheat the oven, then heat it up, then give it to you. You were 30 minutes out from eating anything. It was terrible, Mona. We died, all of us. <laughs> we, we all died, <laughs> right? We, we have no concept. We go, we go 30 seconds without being distracted, and we're grabbing our phones, aren't we? Hey, man, I got, I got my, I love my phone. I'm, look at this. I'm, you know, Pokemon Go. I'm out, right? <laughs> Um, we, have no, we have no concept of, of how we used to be around the altars. And it, it didn't just happen immediately, did it? You know? That God wants to spend time with us. Mount Sinai is where Moses pract was practiced in the presence of God. Let's go to Numbers um, verse se chapter 7, verse 89. I actually chose this text. I had a number of texts I could use to make this point. This was the one I chose because I like the fact that there aren't many chapters that have an 89th verse. Um, but Romans is one of them. Or Romans. Numbers, chapter 7, verse 89. And when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim, and it spoke to him. Moses did not go in and was completely shocked that God was there. 
I mean, how many of you go to someone's house, knock on their door, and you're completely shocked they're the person that answers, right? Like, like I go to Robin's house and knock on the door, I'm not expecting Jake, right? <laughs> Moses walked, I had a friend who was a twin once, and we used to do that. We'd bring his twin along, and what we'd do is have, I'd go up there with his twin first, and we'd knock on the door and act like we're here, hey, that's great, and we'd walk in, and his twin would come up 45 seconds later and knock on the door, and then the people would be like, wait, I just let you in, what happened, right? They're trying to figure things out. Moses went in knowing who was going to be there. When he went into the tabernacle, he knew God was going to speak to him. He knew the Lord was going to be in that tabernacle. He was practiced in the presence of God. He had spent time on Mount Sinai. Secondly, it's characterized that you're ready to move. You know you aren't where you need to be. I missed something in here, and I've got to go back and say it because I've got to go back and say it. <laughs> You know that you aren't where you need to be, but you're ready to head in that direction. You're looking for that cloud by day and that fire by night, right? You're looking for that place where God is moving. You know, even our building here is a tabernacle, right? I was talking to somebody this week about it, and, and they mentioned something funny that um, years back they were trying to do something and actually get another building, and, and the zoning and planning came against them or something, and they couldn't move the church to a different building, so they just, they just kind of stayed here. And, and when I came here, one of the things that I understood about this building is that it was never meant to be our temple. It was meant to be our tabernacle. Did you know that? Did you know that God, and not that numbers are the important thing, but you know God has a bigger purpose for our church than this building can hold. Did you know that? He wants to bring in more people. He wants to, have, God asked me yesterday, how many people do I want in the service this day? And I just said, everybody in Belvedere. I said, that's, you know, if you're going to ask me, Lord, that's what I'm going to say is everybody. Uh, 33,000 people, and I'll figure out where to put them once they get here, right? Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll squeeze them in. <laughs> because I believe that our church is worth sharing with the community. I believe that we should have a voice in the community. I believe that what God does here is important. And the fact that most of our nation, and, and, and I blame the preachers, I do, because let me tell you, the difference between good church and bad church is usually the preacher. Amen? I mean, you know, yeah, I, nod with me, Lee, right. The difference between, and, and, and I hate to say that, and it's not always just that the preacher's bad. Sometimes he doesn't know how to, how to have you know, people skills and to, and to help people in the congregation to get where they need to be. And there's discipleship things and they're all that. But a lot of times it falls back on the preacher. We've got to make church better because we have something worth sharing, right? But see, the thing is, is we're not always ready to move, right? Do you know everybody that's ever built an idol was trying to help God? I was reading something interesting when I'm studying the tabernacle in Mount Sinai. You know what happens when Moses goes up on the mountain, thunder and lightning and all this is going on, and as soon as he gets up there, everybody's like, Aaron, let's make this golden calf, right? And that always struck me as odd because in the, in the Bible it actually says, Aaron says to them, behold your God who brought you out of Egypt. Now, if you're taking that as a normal little piece of idolatry, that makes no sense that they're making a calf after they've gotten out of Egypt and saying what we just made was responsible for that. But when you actually read into what was going on culturally, because they came out of a place of Egypt, where in Egypt the cow was the sacred animal and it represented strength and virility, and the head of the Egyptians god rode on a cow, right? He, he rode on a bull. That was a symbol of being the king of heaven. And they were really just trying to show God, hey, you are really important, so we're going to make this idol here for you. But God didn't want them to do that, did he? Man, do you know sometimes we build a building or we have a ministry or we have a program and we're just trying to help God and God's moved out of that thing and he's done with it and we're still there looking at our little golden calf saying, look God, behold who brought me out of Egypt. This is the God whose presence I dwell in and that's not it. It's just a building or it's just a program or it's even just a ministry. And yet we get so attached to those things. Everybody that's ever built an idol thought they were doing God a favor by doing that. Man, you're not doing God a favor if you're not ready to move because he is a moving God. He is a living God. He is not a God that can be confined to one place. Man, when he wants one part of your life, he wants all of your life. Not because he wants to take over, but because he wants to see you in the fullest expression of what he has created you to be. He doesn't want to just see you bound by sin or bound by bad relationships or bound in a bad job or bound by your circumstance. He wants to see you as he sees you. Somebody who's got purpose and potential, who has people that they're meant to reach, who has worlds they're meant to conquer, lands that they're meant to pray over, intercessors who bear, who 
hold the very healing of someone else in their hands. That's who he wants you to be. And yet we're fighting over our little golden calves. Now I'm really happy in this. This is a good spot for me, God. I'm very comfortable here. We were talking about fasting on Wednesday night, and, and Kristen said, I said, what can you be addicted to? And she said, comfort. And everybody went, what? Comfort? How can you be addicted to comfort? But man, you can be addicted to comfort. <laughs> it's hard to have a good job and a paid-off house and a paid-off car and be desperately seeking the voice of God. Did you know that? It's hard to do. It's harder to do that than it is to be hungry, poor, and destitute because then you're seeking the face of God because it's about eating, isn't it? It's not, about, it's not about can I get a nicer car. It's about what are we having for dinner today. Sometimes we let our, our wealth and our luxury and our comfort take us away from being desperate to be in the presence of God. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying you've got to try harder. And you got to, when we talk about fasting, we've been talking a lot about fasting, and everybody's like, he's going to put us on a fast, he's going to call a fast, they just feel it coming. I am Robin, it's going to happen. But not till the Lord says to, because he hasn't, <laughs> I've been arguing with him about it. Um, I've been fasting, I, I've done some fasting, and you can tell when I'm fasting, I mean when I fast. Um, characterized, your tabernacle looks characterized by a place of growth. If you're not growing, you're not, you're not in it, right? I mean, there should be, and I don't care if you're 137 years old, there should be more God's doing in your life at 138 than you did at 137. There should be, you know, new things the Lord is doing with you this year that he wasn't doing last year. And if there is no growth, right, then maybe you're still back at that place where you got to get your altar together before you can even move into the tabernacle place because the point of the wilderness was not just to, you know, to, to, you know, because they couldn't get in the promised land, but because they couldn't possess what God wanted to give them, right? Has you ever heard anybody say their, their reach extended their grasp? It means they could reach out and grab something, but they couldn't hold on to it, right? If you picture a trapeze artist, they make the jump and they hit the bar, but they can't hold on to the bar and then they fall. And so he was strengthening their hands and strengthening their arms so that when he placed them in that place, which if you know anything about geography, he was literally putting them in the most dangerous place to live in that area. In between all the big superpowers, he makes this little bitty nation that doesn't even have a king and they're going to be ruled by judges and strong men and women who call down hail out of, just whatever, you know, God's going to put them there, but they had to be strong enough to stay in the place he was going to put them, and so they had to go through the wilderness first, and to get in that wilderness, they had to build their tabernacle. They had to get together the things that God wanted to put in their lives so that when they got to their place of destiny, they could hold on to what he gave them. Amen? It's characterized by following. Everybody can hear the voice of God. <laughs> it's when, you know, and it's not when God's like, you know, if God was like, Hey, David, I want you to preach to the nations. Yes, Lord. Hey, David, I want you to mop the floors downstairs. Ah, oh, the kids could do that. <laughs> you know? Right? Right? When God's asking me to do great things, I'm there with him. When he asks me to do little things, I question him. Right? If he's like, hey, don't spend that money on this purchase. You don't really need that, and you probably need to save your money for something else. I'm going to question him more on that than if God says, David, I want you to preach to a thousand people. Right? Oh, yes, Lord. I'm, I'm all about that. Um, right? But if you can't do one, how can he trust you with the other, right? If he can't trust you to forgive people that offend you, then how can he put you in a place of ministry where they will do it every week, right? Sometimes twice a week when they get bored, right? If he can't trust you to take someone's heart and to present that to the Lord, and when someone's opening up to you to give them wise and godly counsel, how can he put you then in a place where you're going to be expected to do that? That would be irresponsible, wouldn't it? Your tabernacle place is characterized by growing and following and cleansing. I like that basin out front. I like the concept of hyssop. When we have our anointing oils in our church, all our anointing oils have hyssop in them. It's just a little thing the Lord put in my spirit when I first got here because when you go to the store and I was like, I don't have any anointing oil at the church, I should go find some. And they have like this, you know, all these different fragrances. And this one comes from Jerusalem, blessed by the Pope. And, you know, walk, you know I don't know what they do. I think, you know, a lot of it's just they like to put a label. But one thing I did like was the word hyssop. Because I know that scripturally, hyssop is about cleansing. And that a lot of times when we're anointing people, we're anointing them because they want, we want to see them healed. But a lot of times what they don't need is healing in their body. What they need is that healing in their soul and the body will follow. Right? That sometimes it's the sin that's beset them or the addiction that's holding on to them or the things that they won't let go of. You know, nothing is gonna, nothing is gonna kill you faster than unforgiveness because it brings on such a stress right? Because you can't just unforgive somebody once. 
I can't unforgive Jake and go on about my day, right? Because Jake's going to show back up and I've got to re-unforgive him. Like, yeah, I'm still working on it, right? Because you see him and they make you mad again, right? And you're, oh, I'm still not forgiving Jake, right? And you've got to decide to hold that on and it ties your stomach in knots and it stresses you. And you begin to have people in your life and you've got to avoid them. You can't be around them. You don't want to get in a conversation where it's just you and them because you're worried you might actually have to like them. I know I'm not speaking to anybody in my glory. I'm not telling nobody nothing. But the results of the tabernacle place is that you gather your items into your ark. And we are right where we're supposed to be. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. If you know the verse, each piece of the ark was built along the way with the things that marked their journey with God. I know a lot of you know what was in that ark before I even say it, but there are three items in the ark, right? And each one of those items, and this is why they call it the Ark of Testimony, because each one of those items meant something to them. What was the first thing that was in there? It was the manna. Because they were out in the wilderness, and they had no food, and they were starving. And they said, did you bring us out here to die? And God rains manna from the sky. And so one day somebody takes a jar of that, and they save it. And then there's another time where they're trying to decide who's going to lead the people as a priest. And so they put all the rods into the tabernacle and a cloud comes over the tabernacle and one person's rod buds. So it's a dead stick and they go back in there and all of a sudden there are buds and leaves coming off the stick. He brought death from life. It was Aaron's rod and that rod goes into the Ark of the Covenant. What was the other thing? It was the Ten Commandments that when God wrote the Ten Commandments with his very finger on the tablet and gave them to Moses, and he comes down the mountain and smashes them. Then he goes back up and God redoes it. Um, if you read your story, and God does it for him again and gives them to him, and he puts those in the ark that those are the Ten Commandments. And these are the three things that you've got to take with you out of your wilderness. These are the three things you absolutely have to have to get from your tabernacle place to your temple place. And if you're still in your tabernacle place, it's probably because some, some piece of these are missing. The first one is you've got to have the word he gave you, right? The Ten Commandments, the word. You've got to have a word from God and not a word a preacher tells you because God will give preachers words over you from time to time. He'll give other people words over you. Sometimes people will pray and that word will just stick in your heart. But you know you have to have your own meeting with God in which you know in your knower, and I'm not talking about an audible voice that has to shake the foundations of the earth and register 8.1 on the Richter in the middle of Illinois because, you know, it'll do property damage. And I don't want to do the insurance for it, right? But you have to get to that place where you know what God has said to you. Now, the thing about that is, is it's not always a microwave place. It's not always a deet, deet, deet start. Okay, God, at the end of this, I would like to have exactly. Did you know sometimes you got to go out there and you got to find God? Did you know that there are secret parts of God that he wants to reveal to you, but he doesn't just give them to you? That you actually have to work for it a little bit? You actually have to search for it a little bit? You actually have to crack open your Bible and start reading that thing and figuring out what it says for yourself? That sometimes you've got to turn off the TV and get away from people and shut everything down and just get in that place and say, Lord, I'm just going to stay here until I know that you've spoken to me. Did you know that sometimes you have to be able to push everything else aside because God is worth pushing everything else aside? for? Do you know that if you value him, then you will put things aside for him? Do you know that you save for the things that you really want? And yet we expect God to come down in a moment and give to us what we never fought for and we never asked for. And people want an anointing on their life that they've never earned and never tried out, and never done anything for. And sometimes you got to go find where God wants you to be. I remember that. I remember coming, <laughs> coming out of a bad time in my life where I had stepped out of church, and I was back, way back before Kristen, before all that, and I was just, I, you know, I had, a, I had an altar sort of lifestyle for a long time where I'd get with God, and then I would get with the world, and I would get with God, and I would get with the world, and I vacillated for a long time, but I remember I got to that place where I'm sitting in my room, and I said to myself, God, I don't know where you're at. I just know you're not right here. I just got in my car and drove. <laughs> I didn't know where to go, but I found him. Do you know, by the end of that day, and it took all day because I went everywhere and prayed everywhere I could think, and by the end of that day, God gave me such a clear word that if I've ever heard his audible voice tell me anything, if I've ever th seen something supernatural happen, it was at the end of the day where I said, God, I don't know where you're at, but where you are, I'm going to go find you, and I'm going to hear from you. And if you're not willing to do that, Second thing you got to have, you got to have the food that he feeds you. You got to have encouragement in your life. You got to have encouragers in your life, right? 
Man, what kept Israel out in the wilderness for 40 years? Complaining. Right? No matter what God did, He gave them bread, they wanted meat. He gave them meat, they got tired of meat. Right? Now they want, every, everywhere they went, it was like, okay, God, feed me, do your thing. I will sit here and receive. I'm ready. Right? At some point, at some point, you got to have enough encouragement in your own soul. you got to take, see, <laughs> when you build a real altar and you know that God has really spoken to you and done something in your life, that's your point of encouragement. And people are always, people in your life will always think you're not as special as you think you are. Do you know that? I know, I'm as shocked as you are, Jake. I think I'm awesome. There are people who have questioned me on that. They're wrong, but they've questioned me. But you've got to learn to stop complaining. Stop complaining will keep you in the wilderness forever. And the last thing is you need the budding on Aaron's rod. You need the calling that he gave from you. You need some life from death. You need to take something that somebody took away from you that you thought, this is a dream I can't accomplish. This is something I can't do. This is something I can't be. I've sinned too much. I've messed up too much. I don't have the skills. I'm not strong enough. I'm not rich enough. I wasn't born with all the advantages that someone else was born with. And yet if that's the calling God has put on your life, then he will bring life out of death. He will bring breathe something into that supernatural and bring something out of that that you couldn't make. And the reason he's going to do that is so that he gets the glory for it and it's not you just being really good at something. Amen? Amen. Man, I come in here all the time and I'm like, God, I have no idea how to pastor a church. I don't know what to do this week, Lord. I just, I'm just going to, you know, I don't know, right? And then God just does supernatural things every single week because I expect him to. This is his church. You know, I always tell them, if this thing falls, I don't look bad, God, you do, right? Because this is your place. I give you, I, you know, I got to set it on the altar. Let me tell you, I do have to set it on the altar because sometimes people disagree with me and stuff like that. And I'm like, they're wrong, Lord. If they're disagreeing with me. They're just, they're not right. You know, I pray, for, pray them through, right? Or sometimes I just got to lay that on the altar too and say, God, you know what you're doing here and you're going to bring your word to pass. You have a calling and a destiny on this church. You have a calling and a destiny on, this, on my life. Did you know just because you receive opposition about your calling doesn't mean that's not the way you're supposed to go? Half the time we get something in our head that this is what I'm supposed to do, that God has called me to do this, and we get all excited about it, and we run into that first person that tells you you're crazy and you stop, and you let that person control your destiny instead of the word that God has put in you. What a horrible thing that you run into that opposition and you say, no, this is where I stop at. Man, the land's going to be full of giants and you're going to look like grasshoppers in their sight. You know, but that's your land. <laughs> and you're going to go kick some giants off of there if you have to, amen? You got to head towards your promise and you got to stop looking back. And we'll close with that. D, if you want to come to the piano for me. <laughs> Every time it got hard for Israel, they looked back. <laughs> you know, the food was running short, and they had to eat man, and they said, man, back in Egypt, we had leeks and onions, right? You know, sometimes... Sometimes you, you walk where you think you're supposed to walk and you do what you think God has called you to do. And man, it seemed like it was a lot easier before you did that. Right? We drop our shield and run. Like what the Spartans used to say, come back with this shield or come back on it. Because in war, if they retreated, they dropped their shield because you had to run fast. And they, and they said, no, that's not what you do. You either come back with this shield or the enemy strikes you down and they're burying your body on the shield. And there are some of you that need to get to the place with God that you say, Lord, if you'll speak a word to me, then I will die on that word. Whatever happens, God, I will move to where you tell me to move. Let me, how do you expect God to move in your life if you already know in your heart you're not going to do what he says? You know, that, <laughs> this is, I had this picture, the, the tabernacle moves, right? The cloud hangs over the tabernacle. And when the cloud moves, they pack up the tabernacle and they go. And I meant to read the verse because it struck me as funny because it was almost like a complaint because he said, and sometimes it would be there for months and sometimes it'd be there for weeks and sometimes it wouldn't even be there till the next morning. Now imagine this because every article in the tabernacle required a specific type of care that a priest had to do and a specific type of setup and you weren't even supposed to touch some parts if you didn't touch them, right? So you're being really careful in how you're handling it and no sooner do you get that thing set up and the clouds, the next morning it's gone. 
How mad would you be, right? Really, Lord, do we have to stop here? And some people, because they get to that place where the Word of God is hard, they leave it untried. They get to that place where it actually costs them something, and that's where they stop. I don't know, play something. I don't know. I, I only know that there's a whole lot of unfulfilled destiny by people that are desperate and frustrated because they're not where they're supposed to be because they got to that place where they ran into opposition, they ran into somebody standing in their way, they ran into the place where they thought they were going to run out of food or resources or finances. They tried to get to that place and it just seemed like the mountain was unassailable and so they hung their head and they turned around and they walked away. God says he's going to bring some life from death. Do you know why in the Bible he talks about making man out of the dust? Because there's nothing more lifeless than dirt, right? There's no, nothing more lifeless than soil. And yet even out of that, God can create anything because he is God. And yet we look at things and say, this is too hard or the struggle is too hard and I can't get there and I can't do this. Let's all stand, every head bowed and every eye closed.